Hey guys, Mr. Backerberg here. In this video, we're going to look at real numbers and some properties of real numbers. In the real world, numbers can be used to measure different things and also can be used to compare different quantities. So we can measure things like distance, speed, time. We could also compare different quantities such as the amount of gas you use compared to the distance that you drive. So numbers can be used in a variety of different ways. And as we talk about numbers, they can really be broken down into two different sets. The first set of numbers that we have are the real numbers. And the other set is called the complex numbers. Now in this video, we're going to focus solely on the real numbers. We're not going to talk about complex numbers here. Now as we're talking about real numbers, there are really four different categories that real numbers can be broken down into. The first category that we're going to talk about are natural numbers. Another name for the natural numbers are the counting numbers, so that kind of gives you an idea of what they're going to be. As we're talking about natural numbers, we're talking about 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth, counting up as high as you can go. From there, the next set of numbers that we're going to talk about are the integers. Okay, and the integers are sort of related to the natural numbers because 1, 2, 3, 4, and all of those numbers are included, but we're going to include more in there. We're going to include 0. And we're also going to include all the negatives of the natural numbers. So negative 1, negative 2, and so on into the negative numbers. From there, the next set of numbers that we're going to talk about are the rational numbers. And rational numbers, typically what people think about when we're talking about rational numbers are fractions. So by taking two integers and making a ratio out of them or making a fraction out of them, that's where we're getting these rational numbers from. So something like a half or negative three-fourths are rational numbers. Even integers can be represented as rational numbers by taking a number and putting it over one. So something like 46 over one is a rational number because it can be expressed as a fraction. The last set of numbers that we're gonna talk about are the irrational numbers. And these are numbers that cannot be expressed using fractions. So something like the square root of two or pi. Those are irrational numbers because there's no way to write those numbers as a fraction. So let's talk about a few properties of real numbers. There's going to be three properties that we highlight, and we're going to start with the commutative property. And there's actually a commutative property that we can talk about with addition and with multiplication. So let's talk about them in general terms first, so without using any numbers. So if we had a plus b, the commutative property says that the answer we get there is the exact same as the answer that we get if we did b plus a. So there, when we're adding things together, the order does not matter. Similarly with multiplication, if we took a times b, we would get the same answer if we did it the opposite way, if we did b times a. So again, when we're multiplying two numbers, order does not matter. So taking 1 plus 7 gives you the same answer as 7 plus 1 or taking three times four gives you the same answer as four times three. That's our commutative property. Property number two is the associative property. And our associative property is gonna work for both addition and multiplication. Here for addition, we're gonna be adding three things together. So let's say we were taking a plus b plus c. And I'm going to throw some parentheses in there as far as changing the order of operations. So let's say we wanted to add b and c together first, so we're putting parentheses around those things. Well, the associative property says that we can regroup this and add them in any order that we want. So if we wanted to, we could add a and b together first and then add c, and we're going to get the same exact answer. Similarly with multiplication, if we were doing a times b times c, and again, let's put parentheses around b and c so that we're doing that first. We're going to get the exact same answer if we were to take a times b first and then multiply by c. So if we were doing 2 plus 3 plus 7, we could add the 3 and the 7 together first, or we could add the 2 and the 3 together first and then add the 7 afterwards. Or similarly, if we were multiplying, say, 2 times 3 times 7, we could multiply the 3 and the 7 first, or multiply the 2 and the 3 together first, then multiply by 7. We're going to get the same exact answer either way. So when we're adding three numbers or when we're multiplying three numbers, it doesn't matter which two we take care of first. 
And our third property is the distributive property. And our distributive property kind of relates multiplication and addition together. So if we were taking A times B plus C, the way th the distributive property works is we take that A and we distribute it to each one of our terms inside the parentheses. So we end up with A times B plus A times C. So if we had 2 times 3 plus 4, we could do 2 times 3 and then add 2 times 4. Or if we're looking at it in a more algebraic sense, if we had 3 times x plus 7, we could distribute that 3 in and end up with 3x plus 3 times 7 would be 21. So those last properties that we talked about will hold true for all real numbers. Now I want to talk about some properties that are specific to fractions. And I want to start with multiplying fractions. So let's talk about it in general terms. If we had a over b times c over d, when we multiply fractions, what we want to do is multiply the numerators and then multiply the denominators. So on top, the numerators, we're going to take a times c, and then on bottom, the denominators, will take b times d. So if we had 1 third times 4 sevenths, we multiply the numerators, so we would do 1 times 4, and then we'd multiply the denominators and do 3 times 7. So on top we'd get 4 and on bottom we'd get 21. Sort of related to multiplying fractions is dividing fractions. So if we had a over b divided by c over d, we're actually going to take this and turn this into a multiplication problem. But what we have to do is use a reciprocal to help us out. Okay, so we're going to leave that first fraction the same. We're going to leave the a over b the same. But instead of dividing by this other fraction, what we're going to do is multiply by its reciprocal. So multiply by, reciprocal means flip that fraction over. So we're going to flip over the second fraction and make it d over c. So now, with multiplying fractions, we just multiply the numerators and the denominators. So we would take a times d on top and b times c on bottom. So if we were taking 2 thirds divided by 5 sevenths, we want to turn this into a multiplication problem. We're going to leave the first fraction the same. That's going to stay 2 thirds, but we need to flip over the second fraction, make it its reciprocal, and then we multiply. So we multiply the numbers on top. 2 times 7, we'd get 14. And then we multiply the numbers on bottom. 3 times 5, we'd get 15. So our answer would be 14 over 15. Next, we're going to talk about adding fractions together. And there's actually going to be two parts to this. The first part that we're going to talk about is when our fractions have the same denominator. So if we had a over c plus b over c, since our fractions have the same denominator value, what we're going to do is we're going to make a new fraction it's going to have the exact same denominator, and we're just going to add the numerators, so a plus b. So if we were taking 1 7 plus 3 7, they've got a common denominator, so we're going to keep that denominator of 7, and then we're going to add up the numerator, so 1 plus 3, so we'd get 4 7 as our answer. But if we're adding fractions that have different denominators, there's a little bit of extra work that we need to do. So let's say we had a over b plus c over d. So they don't have the same denominator value right now. So there's actually a little bit of multiplying that we're going to do. The first thing that I'm going to do is take this d denominator and multiply it on top and on bottom of that fraction on the left. And then I'm going to take this b denominator and multiply it on top and bottom on that fraction on the right. So on top of this fraction, we end up with a times d and on bottom we get b times d, plus over here we get c times b over b times d. So now that we have a common denominator of b times d, we can start adding these fractions together. So with that common denominator, we've got b times d. On top, we've got a times d plus c times b. So if we were taking 2 fifths plus 
3 sevenths. Right now, those fractions don't have the same denominator. So I'm going to take this 7 and multiply it on top and bottom of that fraction on the left-hand side. And then I'm going to take this 5 and multiply it on top and bottom of that fraction on the right-hand side. So on top, 7 times 2, we get 14 over 7 times 5 is 35. Plus, over here, 3 times 5, we get 15. And on bottom, 7 times 5 is still 35. So now we've got two fractions that have a common denominator, so we can add those things together. So the new denominator is 35, and on top we're adding, so we're going to take 14 plus 15, and when we do that we're going to get 29 over 35. Our next property of fractions is going to be canceling a common factor. So if we had a fraction of a times c over b times c. Since we're multiplying by c on top and on bottom, we can cancel that out and end up with just a over b. So if we had the fraction 10 over 15, okay, I'm actually going to do some splitting with this. 10 can be split into 2 times 5, and 15 can be split into 3 times 5. Since we're multiplying by 5 on top and bottom, we can cancel out that common factor and end up with just 2 thirds as that fraction. Our last property of fractions is going to be cross multiplying. So if we've got fractions that are equivalent, so if we had a over b equals c over d, then what we can do is something called cross multiplying. So we multiply across the diagonal. So diagonally we've got a times d. We're going to keep the equal sign between them, and then if we take b times c, that's our cross multiplying. So if we had 2 thirds equals 6 ninths. We're going to multiply the diagonals, so 2 times 9 equals 3 times 6. Well, on the left hand side, 2 times 9 is 18. On the right hand side, 3 times 6 is 18. As we continue to talk about real numbers, we can represent real numbers on a number line. And the reason we're able to do this is because the real numbers are ordered. Some real numbers are smaller than others, or some real numbers are bigger than others. So if we're looking at this number line, we're centered at zero. As we move out to the right, the numbers get bigger. As we move out to the left, the numbers get smaller. So we can talk about specific entries or specific values on our number line and compare them using either greater than, less than, or equal to. So if we're looking at zero, zero is smaller than two, so we could say that zero is less than two. Or thinking about it the other way, we could say that 2 is greater than 0. Those two statements mean pretty much the same thing. But we can also talk kind of in generalities about numbers. So let's say we knew that x was a negative number. So if we're thinking about how we can write this as an inequality, since x is a negative number, if we're looking at our number line, the negative numbers all show up left of 0. So saying that x is a negative number means that x is smaller than 0, or x is less than 0. Or we could say if t is greater than or equal to 4. So to write out this inequality, we've got our t variable. We're going to use our greater than symbol. To do the equals to portion, we're going to draw a horizontal line underneath that greater than symbol. So we've got t is greater than or equal to 4. So there's our inequality. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.